Hey followers, this is your boy, Movie Maker Doug 55. Today I have a two-time Trans Am champion, Tony Ave, and here he is wearing his Harley Davidson shirt. <laughs> well, yeah, not riding the bike today. That's great. <laughs> so you're so you're into all sorts of speed, huh? I am. Snowmobiles, motorcycles, yep, that's it. That's pretty cool. So tell my fan base a little bit of what you're known for in racing. Well, uh, known mostly for my road racing background, a couple of Trans Am championships. Um, but younger, my younger days were uh, world championship snowmobile racing, which enabled me to move up into uh, some SCCA stuff, led to Atlantic and Trans Am racing. And was on the cusp of uh, some IndyCar stuff when I got uh, hurt at the June Sprints at Road America. Got life flighted out of there and and uh, sort of was a life reset. And um, it's been a bit of a road since then, but uh, I still get to do what I like to do. So uh, it's probably all good. Just curious, uh, what was your reaction to witnessing the late race finish between Tony Stewart and road ace ron fellows um i you know i i knew because i'd raced against stewart of course in midget some he was he was just dabbling by that time he'd moved on but i was doing a little bit of it uh there, there's really nothing i'll be honest with you the only thing that separated the ringers back then to the better cup drivers stewart being one of them mark martin obviously rusty wallace some of those ricky rudd those guys were excellent okay the main reason the ringers looked really good and, and why you can't stand out like that now is came down really more to the, to the car setups and the, what the road racers knew they needed out of the cars to make them run better on a road course. If you, and, and in the case of a Ron fellows, this was especially true Boris later on because those guys had a lot of credibility, the crew chief would give them what they wanted. Right. They would they would put the car the way they wanted. A lot of the old school crew chiefs. And I ran into this a lot when I first came down and was testing with those guys. They didn't really want to listen to anything the driver had to say. They pretty much would tell you what you what you should be doing. Right. And and so um, that's why the ringers always looked uh, a lot stronger than the cup guys did back then, mostly because they were allowed to get the cars set up correctly. Right. The, now, fair to say. The old school stock car guys didn't know how to do that. But even if they had rec even if they had tried it, it took a long time for that to sort of work its way out where, where obviously the crew chiefs realized, I guess, you know, we should probably be listening to these guys a bit more. Um, and that's where more of your engineering types came, came to be more of crew chiefs. Right. But back to Stewart and fellows, um, those guys are, are always going to be within a half a step of each other in competitive cars, whether, you know, whatever road course you're on. So, so none of that, surprised me that either guy would be able to run that strong against the other it just was a it was a combination really where the cars were also a good match that that is that plays as much role as the driver what was racing at circuit jills villeneuve like for uh jimmy means okay so i had raced there in the atlantic series a couple of times a few times uh always ran good you know led races there I always was competitive i liked the place um, I went back there first for TriStar and we, we dropped out with an electrical problem, as I recall. And then with Jimmy Means, I had run, uh, for Bob Jenkins at Watkins Glen in the cup race. And, and he asked me if I would, uh, he and Jimmy were close and he, and he asked me if I would, uh, start Jimmy's car at Montreal, qualify it for him. So he'd make the race, but it was just going to be a starting park, you know? And, uh, I said, sure. Not really what I like doing, but I, you know, I was trying to do more cup races with Bob, so I was going to do what he asked. So, so I went up, and you know, we we uh, we were had a pretty good car, even though we it was just going to be a start and park effort. We didn't have anywhere near good enough brakes on that thing, but the car was fast, and the engine in it, which which belonged to my buddy Mark Smith, the engine was great. And so we we practiced, we were good. So we go out to qualify, and it was the first time that we had to run in the rain with that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, Jimmy didn't have any defrosters of any kind nothing in that thing so they decide i went and talked to brett bodine at the time who, who was uh, the series director and said what what you know what are we going to do are we going to 
are we going to points start or are you going to try to qualify or what? And he said, yeah, Tony, we, he said, we're, we're going to have to qualify. We got a TV deal here. We have, we're going to have to qualify. Nobody wants to, but we have to. So I said, oh, great. So I, and I've always done very well in the rain because I've done a lot of it. Right. And I like racing in the rain. So I was to that point, I was looking forward to it. Right. So I get in and I, I, you know, I notice, I said, Hey, where's the, where's the blowers? He said, what blowers? And I said, well, what, what, what are we going to do about the window? And he said, what about the window? And <laughs> so that's when I realized, I guess Jimmy's never raced in the rain before. Right. So I thought, well, I'll get out here and get a lap in. I mean, these, none of these guys are going to be very fast in the rain anyway. I should be fine. Right. Well, what you didn't think about was, so you go out to qualify, you have to, you, you know, you leave the pits. Now you're going through all these puddles and in, and in those cars, there's no fender wells or anything, right? So whenever you run through standing water, it splashes up on the headers and instantly steams the windshield, okay? Yeah. And not only did we not have a wiper on the car, we had no blowers, and they hadn't treated the inside of the window because they just didn't know. And and so I thought, well, how hard can this be? Half these guys have never been raced in the rain. I'll, I'll probably still be, you know, quite fast. So the issue was, I was plenty fast in it. The issue was, by the time I did my whole out lap, you know, coming around to the green to do my first time lap, I already, by the time I had come to take the green, I could barely see out the window then, mm -hmm. right? Now I'm thinking, geez, I got to get around this thing fast enough to make the race, right? And, mm -hmm. and not crash this thing and couldn't see. The last part of that lap, I was looking out the, the side of the window at the white stripe on the road. And fortunately, I had raced at, at that track quite a few times. And I knew the, the landmarks, okay? And there was a certain wall opening at the end of that long back straightaway where they would back a ambulance or a wrecker sort of in between the walls. And that, and that wall was sort of permanent. If you go there now, you'll see that they, the way they've made that wall is sort of permanent right there. So I just went wide open down that back straightaway trying to follow that white stripe until I saw that opening. And then I knew I had plenty of time to stop, right? And I kind of limped and felt my way over the curves and got across the finish line and... Uh, and we, we were made the race. We were fast enough, but uh, I barely got the thing back to pit lane. I couldn't see any. I took the seatbelts off. I had to lay, you know, try to get my glove off and wipe the window enough to see. So that part of it was interesting. And then uh, we just did a start and park deal in the race. But he, even that was sort of interesting. We uh, At that time, Jimmy was sort of battling with one of Johnny Davis's cars for a particular points position that later in the season would pay some prize money. So I'm assuming maybe 25th or something like that. Uh, and so he said, we want to stay out longer than the Johnny Davis's might've been the zero car. Then I don't remember. He said, if they're going to stop early, I want you to run just so we beat them. Okay. I said, you know, Jimmy, we don't have any brake ducks on this car. I mean, like none. I said, and this is a, this is a bad place for brakes. I mean, if you want me to race this thing, you have to put brake ducks on this. Yeah. He said, well, I, I, he said, they're not going to run very long. He said, you only have to run a few laps. So I get out there and, uh, and I'm, I run really good. I run right, right, right up middle of the pack with it again. Cause I'd raced there a lot. And because this weekend had so much rain, most of the guys didn't really know where the racetrack was going yet. So I had a big advantage that way. So I get up to, I don't know, probably 15, something like that. And I'm radioing in, but you know, what are we doing? Cause now the brakes are, even though I'm trying to go easy on the brakes, I'm losing the brakes. And I'm noticing that the engine's getting pretty hot also. They had a lot of tape on the front of it. And I remember it was my buddy Mark Smith's engine, right? So I wasn't going to overheat the engine. I tell him, look, the water's getting too hot. Jimmy said, stay out, stay out. So we have this going on for a while. Finally, I decide, look, I'm coming in. If you guys want me to keep going, you got to pull some tape off the radiator. I'm not going to melt Mark's engine down. I said, but on top of that, dude, I've got maybe three laps of brakes left in this thing, okay? that It's not stopping. And so I, I remember when I came in the pit lane, uh, I don't I don't know where we are. We haven't done a pit stop, of course. I said, where are you? And and uh, Jimmy says, I, I don't want, I remember. I think it was past like the Dollar General pit, right? Right after the Dollar General pit, he says. So mind you, they have, that's Todd Bronze at the time. He's got the big pit box, you know, and all the people sitting up on it. And then like two spots down from them is another big pit box. I don't remember whose, but it was, you know, probably like uh, Miccosukee Indians or something, a big cup style uh, pit box. And in between those two, there's no pit boxes. It's an empty space and just Jimmy and one other guy standing next to him with two radios in their hands. Right. 
And I said, okay, stop here. And I look over and there's just the two guys in the pits. No pit box, no jacks, no nothing, right? And I said, well, if you want me to keep going, you got to pull some tape off this thing. And he said, oh, I think it was the zero car. He said, they just quit. So all you have to do is run more lap. And um, and so I, I drove around one more lap and then we, we parked it. But it, it was, uh, you know, like I say, that kind of stuff is a funny story and made a few bucks. But I didn't really want to spend my time with that, with that kind of racing. I know why those guys do it. I mean, they have to make a living, right? But for me, and I had a lot of opportunities in Cup to do that because I was a good qualifier and I could make the races most of the time. I didn't really want that to be my, that to be how I made my living, you know. And uh, I, I had options because I, I have a business where I build race cars and I, and I don't have to worry about eating. So uh, I elected to not do many of those. But that's one that I did that, that was, kind of, and then it was kind of funny at the end of the day. Yeah, I would find laughter in that too, you know, looking for your pit stall and then you don't see anything except for empty space. You have two guys standing there and, you know, on both sides of them, there's probably like 12 guys in each pit box on, on full uniforms, running around, busy tires stacked up everywhere. And here's these two guys standing there with a radio and a headset on talking to you, right? Like, okay. So uh, what... Uh, tell me about your race at Road America for TriStar. How did that come together? So TriStar was also owned. It was owned by Mark Smith, who also owned Pro Motor Engines at that time. And and uh, he and I had a cooperative business whereby he was providing my Trans Am engines, and I was helping him develop his Trans Am engine business. And we and we became very good friends through all of that. And uh, when he saw that Road America was on the schedule, really all the road courses the first year that he had the TriStar uh, then nationwide team wanted to know if, of course, I'd want to run them. And obviously I jumped at that chance. And, um, you know, Road America was uh, was a could have been a pretty good day for us. We we uh, qualified, I think, ninth in front of Hornaday and and uh, and the like in front of Ron Fellows, we, we were in it, you know, we were really quite good. And, and that, that again is a pre COT car, right? So those cars you can really throw around and, and you can really drive them. And I spent most of the day, uh, sort of climbing my way back again. We didn't have sort of the cup, uh, level pit crew at that time. So we were, we weren't always getting the same sort of, uh, shorter pit stops that, the higher budget teams were getting, but we had the speed and really how it turned out that day, there were two cars that were faster than I was on the racetrack was Carl Edwards and Jacques Villeneuve, but anybody else there I, I could handle. And I, I got up to fourth towards the end. Um, and I was about all I could do. I'd run the brakes off the thing. I'd run it so hard all day coming from sort of 17th back up to eighth and have a pit stop 22nd back up to sixth, you know, but had a good time doing it. And frankly, we had a really good car. At one point, Carl had spun out right in front of me. And that's when I felt like I, you know, I was hoping he wouldn't sort of be able to get back up there because he he and Villeneuve were the two guys I couldn't deal with. And I knew Villeneuve had historically in the stock cars, wasn't always that strong at the end of the race. So I was sort of hoping we would have a shot. Unfortunately, as the end of the race unfolded, we're come, we come to the white flag. I'm running fourth, I think. And, and Carl was leading. Villeneuve was second and I don't remember who was third, but I, I was just going to finish there. Right. We were kind of strung out at that point and I, I, that's all I had. And, uh, then we get to turn five and, um, an Australian, a visitor from Australia just center punched us going into the corner there and, and knocked us out of the deal. I don't know where I got going again anyway, but, uh, uh, finally got the thing started and took off and finished and I don't know, finished 15th or whatever the hell it was. And, and afterwards, um, you know, I got out of the car. I was hot. You know, I was I was not happy. And uh, so I sort of found the guy and kind of had him up against the fence. But I, I looked over my shoulder and I saw three uh, then nationwide officials running at me. And I thought, you know what? This is a ten thousand dollar fine I can't afford. So so I put the guy down and walked away. But hey, it was a good outing for us. But just disappointing the way it ended, but they had a lot of men like that. You know what I mean? It's just uh, the way it goes. 
yeah, that, that happens. And I'm glad you got control of yourself knowing what was going to happen if you kept holding him to the fence, you know? Yeah. And I, and I do a lot at road America, even to this day, we won the runoffs this year in GT one there. So um, I would rather be remembered for the trophies I've taken out of that place versus the fines I had to pay for getting in trouble there. So.